this was just talking about a few few little security extras that we've configured in there to try to make your Tomcat as good as we can. Um, let's move on. Logging. Yeah, logging is maybe a little bit different to what we used to. In some ways, it's it's more flexible. I mean, by default, Tomcat logs into Catalina.out, and also there's a whole lot of custom DHIS logs which happen under opt DHIS2 logs. Um, I think logging in DHIS2 is a little bit of a mess at the moment. I think there's a lot of improvements that we need to make. Um, I, I know that um, there is some attention on it at the moment to improve the logging. For the most part, we log too much. So log files get really big. Um, there was a complaint recently, I think from Indonesia, saying that we're getting 15 gigabytes of log every day. That's sort of a little bit crazy that we're writing more to the log file than we are to the database, I think. So yeah, there's a lot of improvements need to be made with the logging. But you know, the fact is that that Catalina.op log is, can get pretty huge. It's quite hard to find what you're looking for in it sometimes. Um, because our Tomcat is running under system D, it logs through a mechanism called the system journal. And I found it's much, much easier and more flexible to look at your logs through the system journal than it is trying to grep your way through Catalina.out. Um, so if you're inside the container, you can look at system journal journal control oops, sorry which which basically logs all kind of aspects of the system um but the tomcat 9 service uh, if you want to just look at logs which are coming from the tomcat 9 service you run that with journal control minus u tomcat 9. Um, there are many many options from journal ctl and i'm going to show you a few in a minute um, it's worth looking at man, journal CTL, right, the manual. Um, that'll show you some of the extra options that are on there for different kinds of filtering and formatting. Um, generally, the journal control command is, is, is so useful. We made a little wrapper script for it. So that from the host, you just need to type DHS to log view. I think you saw me typing it once or twice already this morning. Um, that just saves a bit of typing. Um, and it's viewing the Tomcat log uh, via the journal control. <laughs> a couple of examples I've given here. Um, minus F means to follow the log. So if you just go DHS to log view minus F, it'll follow the log in real time, throwing out line by line as they come up. If you're looking for particular parts of the log file, um, you can go since and until. So if I only want to look at the log from yesterday, I will go minus s yesterday. It will show me all the log files since yesterday. Uh, the output will, if there's a lot of output, um, you need to pipe it into less. Otherwise, it will all just get to your screen. So that you can page through it with your space key. You can isolate a particular interval. Often, you know, something something interesting happened between 7.20 this morning and 7.22 this morning. If you just want to see that part of the log, you can just go log view since 7.20 to until 7.22. Sometimes it's useful to look at the log upside down, right? You want to see what's happened, what's happened the most recently. So rather than starting at the top, you want to start at the bottom. That's what a minus R does. It just looks at the log in reverse, R for reverse. Let's look at a few of those. Um, so, yeah, inside the container, let's, let's go into our, our new Bob container. NXC, Bob Bash. If you just do journal control, right, it shows you everything that's happened inside this container, including the system logs. This is obviously not just Tomcat. Um, 
everything else that's running under system B is also logging into the journal. So the first bit of filtering we want to do is we want to say, just show me the logs relating to nine. And there we can see what you would normally look at inside your, your Catalina.alps. Right, this is all the logging from Tomcat 9. Um, there can be a lot of it. Um, if you want to look at that, to see what happened most recently, you often find it useful to go minus R, look at the log upside down. Right, now you're looking at, um, this is what happened at 10 o'clock, and this is what happened at 9.37, etc. Right, this looks at log upside down. If we just wanted to know what happens before 9.37, you can go look at the log until 9.37, and it'll show you all the log until 9.36.55 in this case. If you're not inside the container, so if you're just on the host, um, this DHIS2 log view command, basically it's just a, a little wrapper for journal control. So basically you go journal control and the name of the container. In our case, Bob. In this case, we have to we have to pipe it through less because if I just type that, it'll it'll pop the whole thing to the screen all in one go. Slow it down with less, and you can page through the log. Um, I haven't implemented all of the all of the options on journal control, but we've got we've got minus f, we've got minus since, we've got minus until minus g, glow root. I mean, glow root is because of a grep. So um, I don't know. Can we find the string startup in there? And it'll show you. Okay, I really want to find all startup routines done. That's a started is a good string to look for. Not started. Ah, oh, many things have started. Yeah, minus g basically just filters the log. It, it it'll grep lines from the log stuff to do with glow root, there should be nothing in there. So if you just wanted to see today's log, this machine's only been running for 10 minutes, so there's not much log in it. But if we want to just look at the log since today, it'll give us today's log. Um, if you wanted to capture a section of log, you can just do that with a redirect. So if I just want all the logging since 9.37 and stick it into a file, you can make a file called log 9.37, Tomcat 9.37 onwards. I can capture the log like that. That'll just be a section of the log. Um, sometimes if you want to share a log file with somebody, you don't want to give them the whole thing. You're just interested in a small time period of where interesting things are. Okay, so very flexible. I do recommend you read the manual. Um, these are just a couple of little shortcut examples of things you can do. We haven't really talked about the log format. I mean, the default format is kind of as you saw it. It also has a couple of other interesting variations to that. I'm just going to show you, for example, I'm going to go into the, go into the container again. You can also look at log. Um, an adjacent format, no, not format, into what is it, minus F. No, I need to read the manual. Uh, hmm. 
Read manual. Minus O. I wouldn't have guessed that. Minus the output format, right. It'll give you the log in a, in a JSON format. You can also do give it, I think, in a JSON pretty format or a pretty JSON format. Uh, it gives you the, the log like that. This kind of these kind of formats are interesting, particularly if you're doing centralized logging. You want to one of the things you can do with your journal, you can you can send all the logs to a, a central logger. Um, things like Splunk and um, What's the other thing, the common thing in the elk, elk stack? Put all your logs into a, a JSON elastic database. Lots of things you can do with, okay, that's, that's showing me all my log lines expanded as JSON messages. But in most cases, when you're looking at logs, you're actually just gonna look at lines of text okay that's logging logging is important you need to know where to find your logs and as i say if you're looking for catalina dot out um, you're much better off just looking at your logs like this okay uh one of the things that we mentioned on the first day is uh, a little profiler called GlowRoot that we've increasingly found is useful to install on servers. Um, this is to get more detailed insight into what's happening inside your Tomcat container, as particularly when you're having difficulties, particularly performance problems, and you want to isolate where those difficulties are coming from. Um, what I can do, I asked Andrew Mahiri yesterday, if he didn't mind, I can show you GlowRoot running on a live system. It's not really very interesting to look at a test system like this because there's nothing actually, actually happening on it. But we can look at one of the instances on the, one of the servers in Rwanda. Um, I'm kind of afraid to look live because we don't really know what we're gonna find until we get there. Um, yeah, this is running in, in Rwanda. This, in fact, is the COVID tracker where it's running at the airport point of entry, I think, and tracking lab results and things like that. I just want to let you have a look so you get an idea of the flavor of what's inside it and then we'll talk about how you would set about installing it on your own system um okay this is what is happening today well in fact this is what's been happening over the last seven days um oh yeah I need to change that <laughs> title on that is wrong it's not UPHMIS at all this is anybody from UP wondering, this is not your UPHMIS clone. This is in Rwanda. And the first thing I can say, just looking at average of what's been going on over the last seven days, is there's nothing particularly unusual going on today, it doesn't look like, which is good. The overall kind of average response time for all web requests, it's kind of fairly high. Well, it's averaging about 400 milliseconds. Um, it's not great. But it's also not bad compared to a lot of DHS2 instances that we see when they get into trouble. Um, you can see just looking down the left hand column here, which are the API points that are um, occupying the server the most. Um, what this means really is, is, is it's kind of a, a measure of the volume, really, how much CPU time they're using combined with what the throughput is for each each request. And that gives you an idea of which which API calls are 
consuming the server the most. And this one happens to be tracked entity instances query. Right? It's generally listing, I guess, of, of tracked entities. Um, we can look at this in different ways. You can look at the throughput, see why it's kind of averaging, I guess, at peak times up to, to about 700, 800 requests per minute, about 10 per second. It's fairly busy, it's not catastrophically so. Um, get a bit more detail if you look at it more recently, if you look in the last 30 minutes, this is what's been happening over the last half an hour. Um, request rates, yeah, around about 800 transactions per minute. Throughput, yeah, averaging around 400. Um, if we're looking at optimizing anything, this is probably the best one to optimize tracked entity instance query in the sense that this is using up most of the server resources. 40%. Um, and you see these requests on average actually take, a, take quite a while. They take about four seconds. It would be nice to optimize that a bit to get those requests down to something a little bit quicker. Um, to do that, you've got to understand really what is taking the time. And we can see in this case, just by the yellow, you see the yellow there is JDBC queries that most of that four seconds is actually being used up by, uh, um, on the back-end database queries. That's because their database is getting bigger, they're making more sophisticated queries to it. Um, you can dig in a bit. Um, there's a little tab here called Slow Traces. And you can see there's a couple of really slow ones here. This one's taken up to 14 seconds. That's getting close to unacceptable. Um, we can see now a little bit of detail. This is the query. Um, there's various request parameters. Um, if you look at query stats itself, you can see that all of the Pretty much all of the time is taken executing this query here. I don't want to look at detail debugging it now, but basically it's looking at queries like this that sometimes you can find that we're using the wrong type of index or um, um, perhaps they're using too many searchable parameters. Uh, but this is the place to look, start sharing with developers. If you have this on your system, you've got a particularly slow query, you can copy and paste this query and complain. Say, is there anything we can do to make this run faster? So yeah, GoRoot is just a really nice tool for getting a bit of insight into, into what's happening um, at your back end. The other useful thing to look at is the JVM itself. Um, and here you can get an idea of this is what's happening with heap. You can see with DHS2 it tends to have quite an active heap, right? Allocating lots of memory, then cleaning it up again, allocating lots of memory, cleaning it up again. It's got quite a heap churn going from eight gigabytes to 18 gigabytes, right? Allocating about 10 gigabytes of memory over maybe about two minutes and then deallocating it again. This again, one of the areas of DHS2, we're looking at improving performance on, trying not to allocate quite so much heap so quickly. Because you see the consequence of allocating heap is that the garbage collector has got to come in and clean up after it. And again, you can get a good picture here what a garbage collector is doing. Look at the collection time for your two generations. You can see here that every minute or so, um, there's a there's a a young generation garbage collection comes in, and that can be quite expensive. I know this is not too bad. It's it's most about forty six milliseconds per second. Um, if you compare that to the overall CPU usage, process CPU load, um, you can see this CPU is not particularly loaded at all. Right on average, it looks like it's 
Yeah, running at 0 0.122 of the CPU. That's because this is actually running on quite a big machine. There used to be half a dozen other containers running on the same machine. And because the COVID application was so critical, they've uh, actually removed almost everything else off this machine. So um, this Tomcat is running with, oh, I can't remember exactly, um, probably 20 odd CPU cores um, and quite a lot of RAM. So it's dealing with the load quite, quite well. Um, but again, Tomcat, I mean, Glowroot gives you a fairly good indication of what your system health is like and some areas where you might have problems and where you need to, um, um, where you might need to address them. <laughs> okay, so that's just a quick look through on a live system. We haven't found anything interesting on it. Um, which is in a way a good thing because we're not really here to be doing debugging of the system in Rwanda. I just wanted to show you what the glow root looks like. Um, it's an example of a profiler um, which is quite easy to interpret, I think. Um, it's not so easy to set up, right? It's a little bit complicated. It's not really complicated, but there's quite a lot of steps to it. Um, and I've gone through, I thought I would just write down the steps here so that people would be able to set it up on their own system. But as it turned out, I ended up filling up two slides worth of steps. So it's quite a lot of steps. Um, it would be nice to make this a little bit automatic. I've gone part way in terms of you saw, I've got a couple of glow root references already in the configuration files, but let's go through it here. We've created this Bob container already, um, right? It's running version 235 on it. Let's just verify that it's there. What's my... Um, here's my Lin node here. I've got an instance here. This is the instance we just created. Bob, hopefully it comes up. Hmm. Yeah, there it is. All right, this is just a an empty, empty version 235 DHS2 instance. What do we need to do if you want to put the glow root profiler on it? Okay, so I'm gonna go through these steps. Let me just read through them quickly first and then go and do it. You have to go and get the agent, right? So, let me get twice. I've got to download this file, low root version number dot zip into this directory opt glow root. Um, but actually, I'm going to download it into opt. I'm going to unzip it into glow root. Fix that. Download this file into opt, unzip it. Um, there's a little config file for Glowroot, which um, I got a sample of, um, which we need to push into the container. Then we need to change the ownership of that Glowroot directory so that Tomcat's able to read and write in it. Then we need to uncomment the Java agent line and etc. default Tomcat 9. I think I showed you that before. We need to add a proxy location to the upstream so we're actually able to access the glow route. Reload the proxy, restart the Tomcat. We've got to open up another firewall port in our Tomcat container because the glow route by default listens on port 4000. At that point, we should be able to browse to our glow route and it should be up and running. And we set a password on it at that point. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of steps. That's quite a lot of mission, quite a quite a mission to do. Um, I'm going to try and make it a little bit easier for you. For the moment, doing, there's nothing wrong with doing it manually. You may learn a few things along the way. So let's go through this. First of all, I want to take this file and I want to
get it into my ops container, ops directory. Let's get out of here. Go to opt, go get the file. That version number, of course, might change. So you should go to to glowroot.org to get the whatever is the most current URL. They haven't released a new version for a while. Okay, so now I've got the file, I hope. Let's have a look. Yeah, there it is. Glowroot 13 disk.zip. Having got the file, I want to unzip it. Okay, there's my agent unzipped. At this point, I can see I've got um, a new directory there now called opt glowroot. The next thing I want to do, I'm going to go to my slide, make sure I don't forget a step. I'm going to push in the config file. The config file from my server host. I think I've called it, yeah, glowroot admin.json. To change that on the slide. Basically, in this config file, um, the most important bits that we need to set here on the web, the only thing I need to change is the context path here. I want to call this Bob minus glow root, right? Because this is the glow root for my Bob container. This is just the context path, which I'll find it on in my browser. So let's push it. LXC file push. The file is called load admin, and I don't want to push it into the Bob container into opt low root admin.json. Okay, now we'll go back into the container. Let's see that it's there. There's the file, admin.json, right, sitting in place. Next thing I need to do, you notice the ownership of all these files are now kind of all over the place. Some are owned by root, some are owned by 1001. Um, we're going to need to change the ownership recursively to Tomcat, Tomcat, everything in Glowroot. Check that again. Okay, that looks a bit better. Um, right, so I've got all my files in place. Go back to follow my steps. Change the ownership, done with slide one. Let's go to slide two. Uncomment Java agent in a set of default. Let's do that. Okay, at least I have the line in there for you. Um, a line with an error in it, in fact. There you go. Uncommented line for glow root. We needed to, let's just go back and slide again. I need to add a proxy location to the upstream. We'll do that afterwards. While I'm still on my Tomcat container, let's let's set firewall rule. Right, currently, the firewall rule by default is set on here. It's only allowing 8080. Um, so what we want to do is to. I don't need to sudo because I'm already root. UFW allow protocol TCP from 192.168.0.2. That's the proxy. So we've got to allow the proxy to allow from there to any interface on port 4000. Okay, we'll create a new firewall rule just to make sure that Proxy so can actually reach, reach the glow route. Can exit out of there for now. Let's go into the proxy. 
I'm going to talk more about a proxy tomorrow. Okay, but bear with me for the moment. This is an Apache 2 upstream. Its process is very, very similar if you were using Nginx, just the way the syntax for the location block is slightly different. So this is the way that we access our main DHS2 application. I'm gonna copy those lines. What did we call the context? I think it was Bob Glowroot, wasn't it? If we wanted to go to Bob Glowroot, we would do it like that. But container is right, the port is 4000. Okay, so you're basically just copying the lines that you have here that you're using to get the pump. We're adding an extra location in there, which will point us to our glow root container. We can reload the proxy now. With this new thingies, go back to my slide, see what I've forgotten. I always forget something. That's why it's good to script these things. At this point, I've done that, and that I can restart my Tomcat, and I should be able to browse to it. Well, let's see. Um, instead of restarting the Tomcat, I'll just restart the whole container. It's not much difference. <laughs> okay, at this point. At this point, it should be coming up. Use our log view command again. Log view minus f. Bob. There's our DHIS2 coming up. Glow root should probably be already up. Let's go and have a look. What did we call it? Bob minus glow roots. Ooh. Did I call it Bob minus glow roots or did I call it glow root minus Bob? Yep, should be called Bob minus Cloud. That should be up. So why isn't it? It's in my log view again, but this time let's set the cloud, see if there was any errors. Look at it in reverse on the container called Bob. Um, you can see there was an error. Could not create directly off the globe. Temp. Ah, I know why that is. There's a step we didn't do. Um, This is the thing that I said I was going to fix this morning. Now I need to unfix it again. You remember that I tried to make configuration a little bit easier by adding the read write path to upload already in your system control setting. It turns out your Tomcat refuses to start then unless that opt glow root actually exists. So that's why we had to comment it out again. 
but the problem is now it does exist and we do want to access it so let's enable it if we try to toss restart tomcat now we have a warning that says that there's been a change to the config file so let's just reload it go again now hopefully our glow should be up and there we go our newly installed glow root running on the bob container um, accessible there under bob minus glow roots it's not showing anything interesting at the moment even the DHS2 application is not yet even up. Um, and it is it is running. Um, obviously, there have been no requests on it yet. Let me just make a request so that we get some activity. Okay, application is up. Let's request the login page a couple of times. And in the last 30 minutes, we can see a little bit of action starting to happen here. And mostly it's looking at login action, right? And it's loading static content. Okay, as I said, there's very little interesting to see on a profiling system where there's no activity on it. But as we saw from the Rwanda system earlier, um, once you have a system that's running with a good bit of throughput, it's a really useful tool to gain some insights into what's going on. It's not the only tool that you need. You also do need to be able to look at your proxy logs and you do need to look at what's happening on your database. It's probably the most useful tool for getting an insight into performance issues. Okay, so that's a lot of Tomcat. Um, I mean, um, so what I've done really, just to recap, is we went through. Um, Basically, the way that Tomcat is set up in a container um, and some of the security considerations that are in there, some of the places where you can make edits and tweaks and tunings, um, and then this rather more complicated process, not really com very complicated, but quite a lot of steps to it, of installing a profiler to your Tomcat so that you can get deeper insights into what's going on. Um, I've got a couple of do's on my Tomcat. One of the things I'm going to do right now after I stop talking to you guys is to fix up the problem that we have, you see, with a commented out opt glue root directory. Um, I think we should automate this if we're really going to recommend people to install glow root um, as a as a default profiler i should make a little script to automate those couple of steps and that'll make it easier for you meanwhile you have to do it manually um, there are other profilers and um, something called your kit is quite popular a lot of the dhs2 devs use it it can be useful to install your kit um, on a production instance, particularly if you get a developer working hand in hand with you who want to, who is trying to find out any particular issues. <coughs> and the good thing about Glowroot, I guess, is you can do it yourself and you can interpret yourself. Um, you can, developers will get a little bit more insight with somebody like your kid. 
and the, the the setting up of it is actually quite similar to the setting up of GlowRoot. Basically, it's the same kind of thing. You're installing an agent. Um, the different main difference is you're going to access your YourKit profiler over SSH rather than through your web browser. Um, I mentioned earlier already, I want to start testing Java versions greater than Java 8. I haven't done it at the moment because I'm too afraid that it's going to break people's DHS2 installations. Um, would be nice to make these Tomcat container images a little bit smaller than they are. Um, it doesn't bother me too much at the moment, uh, but they'd be a little bit quicker to set up and arguably a bit more secure if they were a bit a bit littler. But yeah, that's all it is that I had prepared to tell you this morning about Tomcat.